because the golden rule says treat other people the way you want to be treated. Uh uh-uh. uh. Marit doesn't want me to treat her the way I treat myself. She wants me to communicate with her or treat her the way she wants to be communicated to or treated. So understand how she likes to be communicated. It will clear a lot of misunderstandings and miscommunications. Hello, Roberta. Thank you very much for joining us today. Hello, Marty. I'm so glad to be here. As am I. As am I. And for anybody listening and for anybody that is not yet familiar with who you are and what you do, could you introduce yourself to us? Thank you. My name is Roberta Andrela. A really interesting surname and one that's quite challenging to pronounce. I'm basically a Zulu South African. I had a corporate career for about 15 years in my country of birth in South Africa. I've spent the last decade in South Korea teaching English. And at the beginning of the pandemic, I actually decided to come and live in the United States. So this is the third country that I live in. And I started to wonder what my basically 25 years of working have has taught me and what I can bring to people's awareness, especially professionals. And especially the 15 years corporate experience, it was more within the engineering sector, management consulting, and my country was going through changes at the time. And so there was just a lot of collaboration and companies bidding for jobs and, you know, rebuilding South Africa, so to speak. And I noticed a lot of the time that here's what university doesn't teach you. It's not the smartest people that get promoted. It's the ones who speak more. Because when you communicate and you speak more, you're more visible. No one tells you that the CEO is not necessarily the smartest person in the company. And when you start to notice those things, especially with engineers, we put them in these boxes of, oh, they're just introverts. They just want to sit in the booth and do their work on their computers. They basically embrace that personality And what happens is when you're in a project meeting and you have people from other companies, the ones who speak more, first of all, they will then get three times their offers later. The company is saying, I saw you at that meeting. You know, we'd like to come work for us. We're going to offer you three times your package. Or you will have someone who's very quiet at that project meeting. And because you're not speaking up, the boss takes credit for your work and those are the things I started to notice I say wait a minute so this speaking thing there's actually something to it it's not that you were brilliant and got A's at university which is great but that does not guarantee anything unless you can communicate and therefore that's when I I started the podcast and and this is basically what we're talking about talk about and bring professionals and coaches who say unless you communicate No matter how brilliant you are, you're not going to have the kind of career that you hope for. Certainly. Certainly. Mm -hmm. And what would you say are some of the key elements or potentially the the key pieces of effective communication? I always say, first of all, the reason we were given two ears and one mouth, we need to use them in proportion. (laughs) So listen more and speak less. My grandma used to say, you know what? When you speak... You already know the stuff you're speaking that comes out of your mouth, right? The speaking about. So when you listen, you actually learn stuff. It benefits you to listen. Communication is not this one-way street of speaking. In fact, when I titled the podcast Speaking and Communicating, and I remember one person, a friend of mine asked me, she said, isn't that the same thing? I said, no. We usually think when we speak, we're communicating. It's That's just one element of it. Listening is even more because one, I need to check with you, Marty. Did I understand what you were saying the way that you intended for me to interpret it, to receive the message? So that's one element, so listening. And then the second thing is um, be clear. 
in your communication. And here's what I mean by that. A lot of the time we use a lot of words and we think more words means more clarity and that's not the case. Actually, the more concise, the better. Because if I use more words, Marty, are you going to get lost in the maze of the whole lot of words or is it better for me to use shorter sentences and you understand exactly what I mean? Which one would you choose? I've learned to choose the shorter because that's what a lot of my my clients struggle with that I, I tell them, I explain the, the grammar and they're like, I was lost in the first sentence. Okay, let's, let's look backwards. <laughs> <There you> <laughs> so, let's keep it short so we both understand each other, right? Exactly. And um, I, think, I think the honesty, yes. And then the third thing is, I know this word gets thrown a lot and sometimes I'm afraid to use it because I feel like it's overused and people half the time don't understand it. The word empathy. It literally means I want to understand where you're coming from with the thought that you've just expressed verbally so that I don't jump into conclusions, so that I don't jump into assumptions and judge what you are saying, especially if it's something that I may not necessarily agree with. So if I have empathy in that instance, communicating with you means before I judge, before I jump to conclusions, I need to understand why did Mari say what she said? Where was she coming from with it? What fed that idea that she's expressing? So those, I'm sure there's a lot, but for me, can we learn to listen? That's why there's so many social media fights. People are not able to listen. Can we be clear in our communication? One of the NASA crashes actually happened because the communication was not clear. A space crash. Do you know how many software companies will say we lost millions because the software engineer started to program something and it turns out they didn't clearly understand the mandate and they programmed something wrong. So clarity, listening and empathy. Try to understand before you get your feelings worked up and triggered try to understand where the other person is coming from. Those for me, I find, especially with human connection and interaction have become more important. And how would you recommend to, to anybody listening to improve their listening? Ironically, how would you recommend for people to become better listeners? Ask questions. You know how when you listen, let, 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 let's use us as an example. So you asked me a question. I responded. If while you were asking the question, I was already thinking of the answer. I never, I never would have gotten the whole gist of what you wanted me to respond to. So I needed to listen before formulating the answer in my head. And a lot of us reformulate the answer while Marty is speaking. So before you formulate an answer or a judgment, ask questions. So if you say something to me, I should say, okay, Marty, let me see if I understood correctly. Is this and that what you said to me? Are you asking me to give a tip on how listeners can improve their listening skills? Did I understand you correctly, Marty? Indeed you did ask questions because it also validates the other person first of all they feel even better knowing that you're not only listening but you understood them and you care about how they want you to receive the message they've just given you when you ask questions you're not going to make judgments you're not going to come to conclusions and make assumptions because that's when the misunderstandings what we call miscommunication start how can you say I must talk about listening skills? Didn't I tell you that this is what I wanted to talk about? You see how differently it comes out. <laughs> but isn't that what we do? True. Because we don't listen very well. We don't, we don't use our uh, uh, two ears and one mouth in proportion. I remember I always tell the story. I have a much younger baby brother. I'm 23 years older than him. I was 23 when my baby brother was born. And I had just discovered, do you, are you familiar with EFT, emotional freedom technique? They call it tapping. 
you tap your emotions and everything. Um, so I had just, it's more to regulate your emotions if you're not feeling good. It's like a healing method, one of the healing modalities. And I had just discovered it years ago and I was sharing it. He had just told me he was in high school at the time. He had just had a bad incident at high school. His feelings were hurt. And I came home one day just discovering EFT and I said, everybody, let's switch off the TV. I'm going to teach you guys this and baby bro, this is going to be helpful for you. And I said, everybody, stop tapping. Tell me how you feel. And we're doing this and I'm showing that in the exercise. He could do it, but I could tell. I well, I know him well enough to know that he he wasn't into it, but he just did it. I'm the big sister. He probably thought, oh, let me just listen to her. Years later, I asked him one day, I said, was there ever a time when you didn't like me as your sister? I know he loves me, but when you didn't like me? He said, yeah, that day you came with that whole tapping thing and you made us do the tapping. <laughs> sister who's rescuing her brother from pain. what are you talking about he said did you ask me if i wanted to do that I'm like, do we bother to ask if people are interested in what we have to say when you're in business do you bother to ask potential customers if when you produce a, a product are they going to buy it? Do you ask the market if they'd be interested in something like that? Or are we busy thinking, I've got the knowledge, I've got the expertise, I'm smart, I'm smart, you must take this. Because that's essentially what I was doing with my baby brother. We, listening is so important. I, I cannot tell you how important it is. So please ask questions. Please don't make assumptions. Don't be formulating answers in your head while the other person is expressing their ideas, and most importantly, don't make assumptions or judgments. And Roberta, with that, I can already hear the voice of my students and of the people that I work with. Oh, but when I ask questions, they will think that I don't know how to speak and they will think that I'm stupid and that I didn't understand and that I don't know enough. What would you say to them? That's where us, uh, and, and we were having this discussion earlier, us as what we call natives, because I have a friend who doesn't like that term. She said it should be abolished. Us, those of us who grew up speaking English, I think we have a responsibility to not make those who did not grow up speaking English feel the pressure and the need to be perfect. We don't speak perfectly either. Since this interview, how many mistakes have I made? We don't speak perfectly either. And so first of all, anybody who did not grow up speaking English and is learning with Marty or with me or anyone else, please don't feel the pressure to be perfect. That is not a requirement. That is not what anybody lives to, not even the late queen. Secondly, when we ask questions, those of us who grew up speak English, speaking English, we are not perceived as stupid or how can she not understand? She's supposed to be smart enough to understand the first time I said it. Nobody says that. Well, unless they're just a very special person, which we're not going to talk about. But nobody. So we, we appreciate the fact that you want to verify that what Marty said, you understood it properly before you respond. So no one perceives that as you being slow we use the word slow sometimes when oh you're so slow how could you not understand me the first time nobody says that so please asking questions is better for both people who are communicating to make sure that you're on the same page to make sure that when you formulate a response you are responding to a question that is being asked because guess what you do when you uh, when you answer a question that's not being asked you're like a politician what is the one thing we don't <laughs> like about politicians <laughs> Mr. President, what would you say is the reason that this economy is doing very badly right now? Well, the war in Afghanistan. Mr. President, I'm asking you about the economy. When you, when you verify with the person who asked, you're communicating with, who asked the question, make sure that you understood it the way they intended. And nobody's going to perceive that as you being slow or not smart that that's not how it is no certainly and i like how you compared it to 
question this direction and answer in a completely different direction. And and like you said, that's what we all get very worked up with. I feel that okay, that that's not what he asked you. <laughs> so, we don't like them for it, don't we? <laughs> indeed. Indeed. Mm. Mm. <laughs> and and Roberta, how would you say that translates into written communication? Because I feel like it's a little bit easier to not have misunderstandings when everything is written and you can reread Elbate. There are some situations where it's a bit difficult to understand what somebody's written. But in terms mm -hmm. of, let's say, the um, the practices that you would recommend or anything that would be a strategy potentially for improving written communication potentially within, within the work context, maybe to a boss or a colleague, what could you recommend? Recommendations for written communication. Mm -hmm. um, just for context, I grew up in the 90s, sorry, I was born in the 70s, so I started my first job in the mid-90s, 1995 was the first corporate job I had. I had my first boss, a mentor, an amazing mentor. He took me to all the meetings where as a junior person, I thought, oh, I'm with the big guns, do I really belong here? But he took me there. He showed me all the ropes. I will always be grateful to him. And one of the things which is funny, at first I used to hate him for this but I've become so grateful over the years back, back then we didn't have internet or google or checking whatever you can online and we would rewrite and rewrite and rephrase a business letter ten times before a, a company letterhead and it goes out and remember who's rewriting these letters me and, and I did not like that at all. Okay, dear uh, Minister of Transportation, this and this and this is the situation. And I sent it to him, I said, okay, Ryan, is this ready? And he'll change a thing or two and make it sound more business-like, more professional. And he'll change it again and again. Like I said, the 10th draft would probably be the final one. And by then I'm exhausted. I'm thinking, what a waste of time. But guess what? Over the years, not only in South African companies, but even when I was in South Korea, I remember my Korean co-teachers would come to me if they want to write a letter and, and they'd say, uh, I want to write, please check my grammar. And I won't just check grammar, but I will rephrase the way my mentor taught me in a way that sounds more business-like because a glass of wine conversation with Marty is different from a business conversation. And they'll say to me, how do you do this? It sounds so professional thanks to my mentor. <laughs> you know what I mean? So now I'm reaping the benefits of that and take that. And the reason I, I explained that I started in the nineties is because I know these days we have texting language, first of all, very summarized, very, you, you have all these acronyms. Half of the time I have to Google, what is NGL? What is SMH? What are they talking about? And then secondly, <laughs> you have emojis, which didn't exist before. One, you need to understand your audience. If you are writing to your senior at work, you have very different, that's a very different email from an email you're writing to your peer. If Marty and I are coworkers and we have a boss, if I email Marty, it's very different from emailing our boss. It's a little more formal for the boss. Straight to the point is to say, hello, Mr. Smith, as per our conversation at the last meeting please find attach the document that you asked me to prepare straight to the point but if it's marty i'm like hey marty how was your weekend remember when we were on the podcast last week oh that was awesome <laughs> listen here's the report as we said just check for me if this is okay and then when you finalize it we're going to send it to the boss do you see how different those two emails are so always know your audience straight to the point. If it's somebody senior, more formal business English versus conversational. And even if you speak to your peers, yes, there will be a formal section. But, you, you know, you usually start with, hey, I hope you're doing well. If, and if they because with your peers as well, remember, you'll say, how is your husband? How's your kids? If, if something happened this weekend, oh, they took the kid to soccer games, whatever it is. You can mention that in one sentence and you need to go to the workman. But with your boss, usually that doesn't happen. So 
that to clear it as well, be very clear. As I said, attach, please find the progress report you asked me to prepare for the client. Please make sure uh, if, if, if you want to finalize it, if, if you have any ideas on how to improve it, please let me know and then we can have it final by the end of the day. Straight to the point, concise, sweet, short, no chit chat. Perfect. And I know now they say uh, also if, if you speak, like say for instance, if it's colleagues that are not very close and they don't talk about family and all that, sometimes some people may feel, everybody's offended nowadays. People may feel offended and say, why is Roberta so harsh? That email was so harsh. So sometimes you put a little emo smiling emoji to make Marty feel a little better that you're not angry. You're just asking for her to give you the report before the end of the day because it's true. So now these days you have all of that at play when it comes to workplace communications, especially written communication. What I would suggest in the, is that read the room, understand your colleagues as best as you can, the culture, the workplace culture, the environment, and, and just adapt to that as best as you can. But yeah, the, the first scenario that I paint is, is basically where I come from. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure how many workplaces nowadays because there's more millennials coming in with the texting language and the emojis. I don't know how many of them are sort of like merging the two communication styles. I would say that's what I've what I've noticed most of the time, or at least the, the people that I work with and they say, oh, hey, I've written this email. Could you check it for me if it's grammatically OK and so on? And then I see, OK, well. It's kind of formal, like you said, but it's not, oh, dear sir, please excuse my, and, and you know, all of that kind of thing. Not, not so much, more of a hello, like you said, John or Mr. I don't see Mr. very often, to be very honest with you. That's something that I know yeah, too with first most name. emails. It's, oh, hey, hey, John, hey, hey whatever. John. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Interesting. My question is, um, do your clients then, when they write those emails, have any of them ever expressed um, an incident where they said, oh, I wrote my boss and he said, don't talk to me like you talk to your friends. Nothing <laughs> like that. No, 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 never. Okay. I, I think, yeah, I think, I think leaders these days, they're starting to be more, like I said, it's like a merger. They're starting to be more open to this mm -hmm. new style of communicating. So they're not as formal as the generation I come from, which I think is a very good thing. Because you don't want that to be a barrier. A, a lot of millennials come with brilliant ideas and, and fresh, innovative solutions to things. And so they are much needed. And you don't want them to feel like they don't belong just because they use texting language. So there needs to be that balance, that, that merger of the two generations of communication skills. Yeah. For sure. For sure. And that's what we what we really talked about for uh, for anybody listening on your podcast, Roberta, what we were talking about in terms of is it the communication or is it the the ideas that you have that matter or is it how you present them? Is it how you speak? Is it the, the vocabulary that you use? Like you said, the emojis that you use? Potentially a little bit of both, but let's not discredit the idea simply because I used a smiley face at the end of my email. So... <laughs> And think, oh, Marie is so casual. Does she know she's a professional? No, it, it, it shouldn't be that way. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> You're perfect. You're perfect. And I was also uh, thinking if we could come back a little bit to, to what you were talking about before with listening, with active listening, like you said, with asking questions to, to make sure that you're doing that well. In terms of listening, and especially if we think of it in the context of another language, be it English or any, any other languages, contextually for people that might not know all of the phrases, all of the vocabulary, all of the, the structures of the language. So it's not necessarily just the communication part of listening, but also the, so to speak, the, the technical side of listening. Do you have any tips for, for anybody like that, that struggles with their listening, but more so again, from, from the language perspective? I find that, uh, as I said earlier, one, it, we need to encourage non-English speakers to stop putting pressure on themselves to be perfect. Because once they remove that barrier, then they are, they are more relaxed and their minds are open to fully listen to what the other person is saying. And secondly, I, 
I don't have that. When I was in school, I, I, I don't know if I mentioned that we, we wrote three papers. You, you, one day exam is your literature, your Shakespeare's and your books and your poetry. A different exam is language and grammar. A different exam is comprehension and composition and making up stories. And all that, all those technicalities, I've forgotten half of them. Because as we say, my, my friend Heather loves this phrase. She says, the, the best English is the English that gets the job done. If you and I both fully understand when we communicate what the goal is, where we're going with this exchange, that's the most important thing. The technicalities and everything, they can take a backseat. I can, I can take care of that another time if I have a coach or a class or something. But right now, the most important thing is for me to understand that, is for me to understand what Marty is saying. She understands me. We're on the same page. Let's do this. Let's get the job done. And therefore, when you listen, Listen less for the technicalities and more for the conversation because most likely you will then get the context of what the person is talking about. As I said, us English speakers, we're also not perfect. So sometimes we're so worded and go around instead of getting straight to the point, you're going to be lost in the maze. So it's the context and, and listen less for the technicalities and don't get bogged down with, you know, because I think that's where a lot of people get lost. No? I think so. I think so. Yeah. Like said, trying to get everything and something that I hear very often. I wonder if this has been your experience as well, but I hear a lot of people getting into the, the feeling of, okay, I missed one word or I didn't understand one phrase and that's where I got stuck. And you forget about everything else that you listen everything to afterwards, else? but you just get stuck to just that one word. Oh, I didn't know that word. But what, what does that mean? What does that word mean? Did I hear that word before? And the rest is just a... <laughs> in essence. So <laughs> like you said, focusing on the, the key words that you can get and just trying to piece together the message and hoping for the best. <laughs> and and here's the thing. Let, let's take that, that word, that one word example that tripped you up. You can Google it, Google Translate. And then so that you don't miss out on the rest of the conversation because that, that one word making you stuck. I had a history teacher. Here's why I didn't like history at school. My history teacher was obsessed with bombastic words. And Because I used to sit there thinking, who speaks like this? I've never heard of that. I've never heard anybody use that word in a conversation before. Who speaks like this? And he will take the word, say for instance, a word like nonsense. And he knew 10 different difficult bombastic words he would write on the chalkboard, meaning nonsense. I'm like, nobody, nobody says this in real life. Why is, why is he even telling us this and wasting our time? So one thing, the thing about clarity also in communication is the fact that you want people to understand you. So you, there's no need to use big words. There's no need to use words that you need to Google and thesaurus and the dictionary and Miriam Webster and find out what they really mean. There's no need for that. Because at the end of the day, you want people to understand what you're saying so that the job gets done. So when you listen, if you're a non-English speaker and you're listening to somebody who grew up speaking English. Yes, you might be tripped up by the accent sometimes, which we talk about. I'll be honest, I had a friend when I was in South Korea, <laughs> he was from Scotland. To say that it was a challenge to hear sometimes was is an understatement. Sometimes I've had to ask him, I said, pardon me, Kevin, what did you say? Because I didn't hear what he said. And I grew up speaking English, but his accent used to trip me up. So we also have moments when we have to ask the person to repeat themselves to make sure we understood them. It doesn't mean I'm slow. It doesn't mean I'm not smart. So if you don't speak, if you don't grow up speaking English, even more so, you can say, I beg your pardon. Sorry, I'm, let me, I'm not sure if I understood that. Please repeat that last statement. No one ever called anybody stupid just because they asked you to repeat what you just said. 
I feel like Scottish people just get all the <laughs> all the hate from the rest of I mean maybe not hate but they get all the the negative emotions in terms of language because they have the exact same story from Australia <laughs> I had one friend from Scotland and one from Australia and they would be like what did you say oh I said this what <laughs> and i always like laughing at this to my students that look both native speakers did not understand each other so you've got nothing to worry about <laughs> Marty, okay yes. and trust me i love kevin sweet sweet guy love him to pieces but when he says we're going to work mate I'm like huh we're going to work mate but when he says it with the accent and the way the the diction comes out, it, it doesn't fully project mm. and then combined with the accent. And there's a bit of a faster pace there than the way I speak a bit slow, I think. There's a bit of a faster pace. So those three elements alone from that statement would usually be the reason I would ask him to repeat himself just so I could understand what he's saying. That's just how it is. <laughs> Him, let me ask you something, Marty. Do any of your students within their native language, don't they ever ask their, their fellow native speakers to repeat themselves? I love to ask the people that I work with the exact same question. Like, oh, oh, should I not be asking a question? Do you never ask questions in your native language? Oh, well, I do, but it's different. It's, really? No. It is the same Thing. it is the same thing trust me it's the same thing we need to stop putting english uh, on this pedestal of thinking suddenly the rules change with it or it, it's it's better than other languages i used to tell this to my korean kids all the time i say you're not learning english just because it's better than korean it's because your government thought, okay, the world is becoming global. If you want to have global opportunities outside of South Korea, learn this language. And, you know, if you went to America, it will make your life a little easier. But let's pretend you want to spend the rest of your life in South Korea and never leave. You don't need English. So we need to stop putting it on this global pedestal of, oh, yeah, it's, it's not better than your language. It's the same thing. We have the time ask each other what you mean because we didn't understand each other and we're both speaking English. Very true. Very true. And that's something that, I, that I've seen a few times that English is not a measure of intelligence, which is wonderful. Because like you said, I mean, if you don't intend to leave your country, then you're probably not listening to this. <laughs> but if you don't want to do that, then more power to you i mean if you've got everything that you need who's to say that it's like you said better or worse or anything that you need to change within that for sure for sure and i think that leads us very nicely into uh into the the next question but unless you want to add something to that no i i, I re reiterating what you said i fully agree with you and parents nowadays also and i'm not judging because i'm not a parent i i shouldn't speak on parenting my friends used to say that the native language of the child even if the child is growing up in the the, the english-speaking country and you're from a non-english speaking country i met some korean friends of mine who came to south korea to teach they had been adopted by american families from an orphanage back then you know when they were kids and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, I'm going to Korea to teach so I can pay for my student loans and I can travel. I went there for traveling. Many people have different reasons for doing this. And my Korean friends who were adopted as children and brought to America would say to me, where I grew up and I thank my American parents for giving me the best life they could. But where I grew up, nobody looked like me. And so I decided when I graduated, I wanted to come and teach in South Korea to find out who I am, my roots, my culture, the people who look like me, where do I come from? So I would encourage, based on that, some of the, the stories I heard, I'm not going to cover all of them in this episode, but I would encourage non-native parents who raise children in your Australias and your UKs and your US's to 
give them an opportunity to learn their native language if possible. I saw that a lot in, in Australia, people, or especially kids, like you said, from a lot of different roads of, of life and just coming there. And, and I would ask them, oh, so cool. So you're from Brazil, for instance. Do you, do you speak Portuguese? No, no, my parents never taught me. And to me, that's just a little sink in my heart that, I mean, I get that because you won't get maybe the judgments that, oh, you're, you're not a native and any of that kind of thing. But I mean, there is a whole breadth of knowledge within Portuguese that you'll never, ever get in English. And so, like you said before, mm. I suppose this just proves your point that it's not better in any way. It's just used for different things. It's for different reasons. And when uh, kids learn languages very easily, if you grow up, you can grow up speaking both the Portuguese and the English. I grew up speaking both the Zulu and the English. You know what I mean? You know, because imagine if I was a Zulu South African who cannot speak my language, my identity, how, how do I connect who I am? You know what I mean? Hence my Korean friends going to Korea to say, I want to see where people who look like me come from. Basically, that's what that was. So if I was a Zulu, my ancestors are Zulu, but I can't speak Zulu. What, what, what do you mean? So, so what am I? <laughs> you know what I mean? So yes, every language is important. Your culture is important. English is just currently a global language of business. Who knows what's going to happen in however many years to come. So yeah, it's, it's not on a pedestal. I, I love what you said and maybe we can we can discuss this a little bit with in terms of your identity with with both of these languages do you feel that they are connected do you feel that they're separate and perhaps the the people that you worked with like you said in, in your 10 years of, of teaching English in in South Korea did you ever notice that that people would get a bit of a different way of being like you said a different kind of self-expression because they were using a different language or perhaps if they didn't speak English as well did did that like you said that that self-expression perhaps that personality change mm -hmm. one it affects their confidence mm -hmm. I would have a, a kid Dongu, for instance smart excels in every other Korean class your math your sciences everything but when it comes to English class, and, uh, and I'm glad for schools where I had a Korean co-teacher with me, because a lot of the time I would need to understand below the surface, not just the kids' behavior, but below the surface. And by behavior, I don't mean bad behavior. Oh, no, they're very well behaved. That's why I love teaching Korean kids. Very well behaved. But in terms of thinking as a teacher, I know you know the answer. Why aren't you putting your hand up? And my Korean co-teacher will explain to me the shy they don't want to make a mistake and all that's how I got to understand those things because she understands more deeper on why they act the way they do in English class when in math class they're superstars um, because of the language so as soon as they have to switch you can see even the body language the confidence goes down and now the overthinking and the over analysis of whatever comes out of my mouth is Roberta teacher going to validate it? Is it going to be perfect enough for her to tell me that I'm smart? Just like my Korean teachers, when they teach me math and science, tell me that I'm smart. Is she going to think excellent? Because I get told in Korean class that I'm excellent. All of that goes through their heads. That's why they're not keen to raise their hands in English class. Because as soon as everything switches to English, something happens. Their confidence goes down, they overanalyze, they, they don't think they are as good enough as they were in Korean class. They suddenly think they don't have the capabilities and the competences they have when they're in a Korean class and free to express themselves in their native language and suddenly they're in English class and they're wondering, am I even good enough as a student? when they're busy being, getting 100% in, in, in those classes. It's some, something switches. You can literally see it when you observe it. And it's very sad, actually. I think so, too. I think so, too. And I see that very often, even with 
with adults, like you said, you can you can see the the tense shoulders and the <laughs> sliding down in their chairs as you ask them a question. And it it is very disappointing. It is very disappointing. It's like you said, I don't want to blame other people for how other people feel because I'm a very big believer in you deciding your own destiny and so on. But but like you said, I mean, there is that sense that we, let's say as quote unquote native speakers, what you said before, there is that pressure that we put on other people that, oh, hey, look, I speak like this. Why don't you speak like this? Which, I mean, how could they possibly? I read a book once about this, actually, and I wonder what your thoughts about this are, that mm -hmm. it's a little bit like an apples to oranges comparison. And I very, very much love how they showed that, that you can't expect a bilingual person to hold two monolingual brains in their head. They just have the one and they have to marry both languages into one and they can't have the exact same knowledge and the exact same vocabulary and everything of a monolingual English person and a monolingual, let's say, I don't know, Brazilian to keep coming back to our Brazilians. You can't have both of them at the same time. You just have the one and you need to make it work somehow. You, you make it merge. And the thing is, speaking of being bilingual. Some people are bilingual and none of those two languages is English. True. But you have English speakers who only speak English. So who's in that scale, on that scale alone, who's smarter when we measure on the language scale? If you speak three languages and none of them are English, you speak Portuguese, you speak Spanish, and you speak Polish. If I only spoke English, who's smarter in that regard? The one who speaks three, I only speak one. And yet, like you said, sadly, English is used as a measure of intelligence. Who decided on that barometer? The colonial. Because the fact that you, exactly. The fact that you can speak more than one language just because none of them are English, the world doesn't think you as smart as a person who only speaks one language, which is English. That's crazy. Even by math standards, that's crazy. <laughs> that is absolutely crazy. I would say so. I would say so for sure. And I and I think that nicely leads into what, what we're talking about here into something else, Roberta, that I wanted to ask you about. I wanted to talk a little bit about conflict and perhaps negative experiences in in the language because this is something that i experience not very often firsthand but i do hear about other stories of, of the people that i work with for instance my my clients and my students that there is some kind of disagreement or there is an argument whatever that might happen to be and I feel like everybody always feels very confident to debate and to negotiate in their native language. But then when it comes mm -hmm. to English or any other language that you're speaking, a lot of people get stuck that they don't know the words. They they just don't know how to to argue <laughs> in, in a sense in, in another language. But in terms of just the communication side of things, in terms of not trying to escalate just because I'm right, but how do we work this out together? What are your thoughts, perhaps any tips or strategies on effective conflict resolution? Do you want me to share my thoughts on if a non-English speaker has a debate with an English speaker or just in general? Maybe in general. In general, okay. Conflict. First thing is... I always say the fact that I love my brothers to pieces, but I still sometimes debate with them tells you that I'm going to, I'm going to do just about anyone. There's always, there's always going to be a disagreement. We're not always going to see eye to eye. We grew up in different households. We have different perspectives. We see life the way we see it. And therefore, I'm not going to always agree with what you say because you come from your perspective. I come from mine. So whenever there's conflict we bad heads right the first thing especially in the workplace let's take the workplace for example the first thing we need to establish is 
I need to understand how you work, Marty, versus how I work. You might have a personality where you you like just getting to the end goal. You just want to find out what the end goal is. And that's what you are interested in. And when we have a discussion as a project team, that's what you are interested in knowing about. I am detailed. I want to know what step one and step two and step three and step 10 to get to the end goal is. And until then, I'm not interested where we're going. If you don't give me details on how we're going to get there, my anxiety is going to be up. I'm going to need my pills or whatever the case is. And so when you first understand each other's personalities and how you think, that really helps. In fact, I've, I've had a lot of coaches who they do those exercises when they go to company trainings and everything and facilitate understanding personal. You've got the DISC assessment these days understanding each other's but because teams are fighting just because they don't understand each other and how we uh, and how the other team members work so when i understand i'm like ah oh, you want to know the end that's why you're fighting with me because i'm wasting your time wanting to know step a b c and d oh okay no here's the thing marty at the end of this project we should have done this by this for the client and you'll be like ah oh, that's what that is Oh, okay. And so then when I tell you, when I say, let's discuss the steps A, B, C, and D, you are now interested because I've settled in your mind the end goal because that's what you're interested in. So understand each other. I mentioned empathy earlier. Like I said, this word gets thrown around a lot. Understand where the other person is coming from. Whatever fed their idea, they are whatever they're expressing, understand why. Ask probing questions, ask leading questions. You know, the most effective, ineffective questions are the yes or no answers. If I say, if I say oh, Marty, you wanna do this this way? Oh, you wanna do it this, you wanna finish the proposal? You're either gonna, yes or, gonna say yes or no and walk away back to your desk. I didn't get as much information as I would have if I said, why would you prefer to do it this way? Help me understand. And then you explain to me. Because if you say no to me and you walk away, I am, I'm like, you know what? I wish I could transfer to another team. I really don't want to work with her. She's nasty. You know what I mean? And that's all that starts. <laughs> that's how the, you'd be amazed. The little conflicts are caused just by not, not asking the right questions. Assuming that when the person is walking away, it's because they are just saying, you know what, I don't care what you think. It's because maybe you didn't even ask the right question. You just asked the yes or no. When they give you the right, the, the yes or the no answer, they walk away. And you think, how did she look away like that? You, that's all you did. You know, so understand where people are coming from, understand how they work, understand their personalities, even in relationships. They're like, why would you say that? Why would you think I would communicate something? Here's what I always say, especially in personal relationships. And I said this to my mother the other day. I said, you know why you should give me the benefit of the doubt, Ma? Even if you haven't verified with me if I'm guilty of that thing or not. Because you know my resume as a daughter. No, you You've known me for 47 years. Surely you can, but I'm going to check with her. I'll get back to you on that, you know. So when you've worked with people long enough, you have their co-worker resume. You know what they are like. You can give them the benefit. Of, you can, ask, don't assume the worst and say, you know why she took this report from my desk? It's because Mari just wants to sabotage my promotion. And she... All she, she needed it because she wanted to check page 41 because she needed a clause from there. She was going to get it back. And now you've just thrown a tantrum. And when you assume the worst, that's what happens. So conflict, a lot of the time, conflict is just people not asking questions, people not just assuming the worst and not really going deep and, and just always remember Whatever the issue is, attack the issue, not the person. 
So if you take the report from my desk, just for two minutes to check whatever page you need and bring it before you bring it back and I assume the worst of thing, she's sabotaging my career. That's me personally attacking you and saying you're a person who goes around sabotaging careers. Are you that person? Completely not. So you'd be um you'd be amazed how much conflict is caused by people not asking the right questions and assuming and jumping to conclusions, both personally and professionally. Marriages and people jumping to conclusions, unfortunately. For sure, for sure. There is a um a very nice for anybody interested in that. There is a psychological phenomenon, the attribution bias. Perhaps you've heard of it. It's exactly what you're talking about. That. Typically, when we think about our own actions, we attribute them to the outside world that I was late because there was traffic. I was late because, I don't know, somebody called me and I had to answer the phone. But when somebody else is late, it's their personality. You're late because you're always late. You're late because you don't care about me. So there is that attribution to completely different parts of the world, whether internal or external. Oh, I'm late. Oh, no, it wasn't my fault. And and I feel like we, we get stuck in that and even unintentionally that, oh, look, you're late because, you, oh, you're always late. No, maybe there was just traffic. Like you said, not not assuming, like you said, not jumping to conclusions that I know everything about you. But like you said, maybe you just had to answer the phone or you just had to put on lipstick before you <laughs> before you started the meeting. So you never know exactly and here's the funny part about that when the shoe's on the other's foot we suddenly don't understand but we want understanding when we are late you know and we, we always say the thing about communication marty is that the way i communicate to you is how i communicate with myself my inner dialogue how i speak to myself if I'm kind to myself, most likely I'll be kind to you. Okay, there's also the thing of sometimes I'm not kind to myself, but I'm kind to strangers. But if I am, if how I communicate to you is how I communicate with myself, that's why, in fact, the, we call it the platinum rule. Because the golden rule says, treat other people the way you want to be treated. Uh-uh. Mari doesn't want me to treat her the way I treat myself. She wants me to communicate with her <laughs> or treat her the way she wants to be communicated to or treated. So understand how she likes to be communicated. Earlier, I made the example with, with the business written language. A, a CEO wants to be communicated with just a one line up, or, or basically on the subject of the email, because he's busy. You're not going to ask him about the weather and how his kids are. He doesn't have that kind of time. That's how he wants to be communicated to and his preferred method. Some people want to be communicated. Some people, you, you, you jump to the headline and a person says, give me the details. Some people, you give them the details. They'll be like Marty and say, give me the headline. Understand how people want to be communicated to. It will clear a lot of misunderstandings and miscommunications. Indeed. Indeed. And Roberta, for anybody that wants mm. to listen to more of your words of wisdom and to, to more of what you have to say, where can people find you? Thank you so much. Um, in So the podcast is called the Speaking and Communicating Podcast. It's on Apple, Spotify. We have a YouTube channel where I upload videos of my interviews. One upcoming with Marty. Wonderful conversation we had. Indeed. And then on Instagram, you can find me. My handle is coach and speaker. All one word, all small letters, no punctuations, nothing. Coach and speaker. And for Marty's listeners, I can give them a free 30-minute session. If they DM me and they write Marty Education on Instagram, Marty Education, DM me, I will give you a free 30 minute session if you're listening to Marty's oh, show. Wonderful, wonderful. Maybe I will do that too. <laughs> Would love that. I love talking to you, so you know, <laughs> for you, it's going to be an hour. <laughs> perfect, perfect. And and Roberta, mm. tell me, do you have any final words of wisdom, anything that we didn't touch on, but still something that you would like to share? Um, this is very dear to me, and this is an experience we share because we both um, 
have clients of non-English speakers based on experiences teaching them. English is not a measure of your intelligence. Do not feel the need to be perfect. Nobody is, neither are we. And know that if you don't express your ideas just because you're afraid of what you perceive, perceive as you're not perfect English, you are going to be perceived now as, as, as not as brilliant as you are. And I know you're brilliant. Showcase your brilliance. Speak that English. Even the, non, the, the native speakers are not perfect English speakers too. So speak up. Show your brilliance. Please don't hide. Your brilliance is needed by the world. Perfect wisdom at the end, Roberta. Thank you very, very much for your time. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sharing all of your very kind words. And I, I'm inviting, again, anybody listening to go check out your podcast after they were done. Thank you so much, Mari, for having me today. This has been wonderful as always. Hey, I'm glad to see you here. Let me know what you most enjoyed about this conversation. And if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. I'll see you in the next one. Do the button, yeah.